had the burdens of regulation interfering with our work or at least making more work for us than we maybe thought was justifiable. Uh, and there are dangers. There are dangers surrounding funding. There is the possibility of public hostility uh, and the whole field, which we're so excited about. It. I think there's a real air uh, atmosphere here of anticipation um, is possibly jeopardized a bit by these factors. And I think this boils down to saying, let, let's, let's get real. This is a political situation more than anything else. And also, it's a situation where we can't just cast everything once in concrete. Uh, and we have to be flexible. We have to be constantly uh, adjusting to the, the new realities, whether the, the realities of research or the realities of uh, public policy and, and the political climate. And that we ought to address these things in a broad way. We have to recognize the influence of the media. The media will make hash of almost everything we say to them unless we're extraordinarily cautious about it. We need to cultivate the members of the media who are really dedicated to doing a, a, an honest and, and scientifically respectable job. We also need, through the media and through other means, to educate people. We desperately need to educate people on all these points that uh, um, George Post was mentioning. And I think we also are at a point where, as was suggested by Roger Brent, we need to define the culture. There is a kind of a culture of science, and we need to set role models and expectations so that as new people come to this field because it's so attractive, they will suddenly say, oh, that's how they do it in that particular area. And my final point is I'm convinced inaction uh, invites trouble. I think action should be something taken not by a board of the National Academy of Sciences, not by someone who is affiliated or a group that's affiliated with any particular organization, but something that can be as independent as possible and only influenced by uh, the intelligence and, and degree of uh, information that's available uh, for the scientific community. So that, that, that's my, my, my perception of this. I'd like to know if, if from what you said that rings true to your understandings. It definitely does, although I think the easy version of that... Uh, okay, let's be brief. Uh, the educational system needs major reform. In Germany, I have the figures over there, something like 70% of the people think that genetically modified foods either don't have genes... Uh, I could go on, right? 70%. This is, in a this is the country that every single bioethical law, consideration, and, and vigilance was put into effect so the Nazis would never return. And 70% of the people think that non-genetically modified food don't, 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 doesn't contain genes. So the, something has got to be rethought about what the educational system is on the one hand, but then what is the relation of ethics as it's being articulated to uh, the scientific community? And the scientific community, if you want that defined for you, it's happening. If you want to define it, if you think there are inherent virtues and a way of life in science that is, that is uh, of great worth, you've got to start thinking about figuring out new ways of talking about it. I study this stuff. And I can tell you, the last great statement on why science is worthwhile was Max Weber in 1917. 1917. There are statements. Most of them are mush. Okay? So it's time for some mobilization internally and serious thinking about what science as a way of life is. And that's point one. And point two, we now live in a global world. It's not defined. Many people have regret for Jim Watson's, maybe not here, but elsewhere. Jim Watson's little world of basically comfortable white men uh, without patents, without et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That world is gone. In any case, that was the world of the Cold War and with a certain set of privileges. That's finished. So there are three vectors of globalization at this point active in the world. One is capitalism, two is science, and three is is humanitarianism. They are not in any happy relationship with each other. And I think that serious thought has, has come up in a number of different cases about how they might articulate is very important. Because as it stands now, as, as, as George pointed out, humanitarianism and capitalism 
are actually on a different side of many issues than science. So some realignments and new alignments are really crucial in this, or there are going to be some very unpleasant changes taking place, which might well include one of these bioterror catastrophes that Roger and others um, uh, think uh, and I agree with are could, could well happen. But the, net, the, the result of that is not going to be the kind of organization regulation of the scientific community that very many of us in this room would want to live with. Let's take one more question. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to follow on from the point about education and, and urge people not to assume a model whereby education is seen as, as it were, a cure for ignorance. Right. Because the problem, as, as I perceive it, is much more one of denial than one of ignorance, and denial has very different dynamics from that of ignorance. I mean, this is something we see throughout the environmental debates, in that people, there are things that people do, there are things that people do not wish to think about, and this, and I think that comes through very much in your discussion of Conguiem and denaturing of nature. It's not that people don't know at some level that; it's that they don't wish to know it. Right. Really agree. Okay. Do you, George, do you want to say? Yeah. So let's let's thank Paul and George. For that. So we're going to continue yesterday's poster session just as before. Um, there's also been uh, an organization of a rally point uh, for those who are interested in uh, having some uh, food and good time uh, at a place called Polkari's. If you're interested, um, people are thinking of going over around 8 o'clock and their maps out at the registration booth. It's just a couple blocks walk from here. So poster session from now till 730. Polkari's at 8 if you'd like to meet up there. And then we're, we're back here tomorrow for those of you participating at 9 o'clock. <laughs>
could take a couple months there. But you know, the the issue is just getting something that's meaningful and uh, uh, conveys an appropriate sense of gravity without an undue um, sense of alarm or risk, because uh, we don't know that that's the the right action either. So. The second step would be, as the committee set up, to notify everyone who came to this conference of an email site and then to invite people's comments and thoughts and participation. So if someone's aware of an issue or concerned about something and thinks it's a, a something the committee should consider, uh, the committee would uh, have the benefit of everyone's wisdom and thought over the coming uh, year. The committee also, uh, by uh, being present, having a web presence, would be a, so, and having some meetings would be a source of contact uh, for other groups that had concerns uh, or ideas in these areas. The committee would meet uh, several times over the next year and report back at the next synthetic biology meeting, uh, perhaps with an idea, certainly going through what uh, uh, their thought processes had been and what comments they had received but also perhaps, uh, if they deemed it appropriate, suggesting specific motions or actions for uh, vote or consideration at the next meeting. So that's a proposal. And then I, I guess maybe we'll start uh, with a few comments on that if people have reactions or other ideas. Can, so, can someone take notes on? So it's an important thing to consider. You know, lobbying also becomes a full-time job, and so we probably have to hire a staff to do that. You know, so that's that. But that's something to to consider. And I think a lot of it comes uh, to start with from the way the this community represents itself. You know, who it uh, interacts with, whether it acts in a way that scares people, and whatever. Well, I'm worried that if you uh, become too a line item, shall we say, it become uh, too apparent uh, too fast, then there is in fact uh, a, a, a chance for a strong back reaction. And the right thing to do is to, is to actually understand ourselves a little better before we become very public. I think there's, you know, I certainly can see strong benefits to that. And, and I also, that's the reason the name uh, matters so much to me, because if the name, it, really we don't know what the issues are. Is, uh, and and we don't know to what extent we are different from things other biologists are going to be doing. So I think we have to be a little careful not to get so concerned about ourselves that you know we shouldn't be policing ourselves in a way that yeah. doesn't protect against dangers through you know other areas of biology. So if I could, just, so here, um, uh, so in that regard, and your, I think your point about the lobby. The, 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 the influence and the power of lobbying in Washington is well taken, but the biotech industry ha does have an organization. I, um, I, um, um, I have no idea how effective they are, but they, but they do have a major presence in Washington. They just had a meeting out in, in San Francisco, and there was an NPR report about some declaration that the industry was making uh, as, as a way uh, to demonstrate that biotech is doing good for the environment. And, you know, they, they were uh, hyping, uh, maybe it wasn't hype, you know, the green nature of some of the, the biotech. So I just raised that as a possible yeah, and anytime uh, we can organization that one could leverage, uh, you know, via, you know, via some uh, clever interactions. Because the, 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 the issues that, that, that biotech deals with uh, are... Um, you know, are, are not that different from, in, uh, you know, from this, uh, the synthetic biology area. It seems to me it's part and parcel. And, uh... The other major, for the biological sciences, there is a major lobbying group in Washington uh, under the auspices of FASA and its various other organizations. Like the ASCB has a very organized lobbying effort that I've been part of. So. There is a presence in Washington. 
Yeah. I guess from my perspective, uh, you know, one of the things is, is that before we start lobbying, we have to figure out what it is that we'd like to have happen. And uh, I, I have no clue myself, and uh, so I think it's a little bit premature to be having a discussion about who's going to do the lobbying before we figure out what the lobbying is that we want to have done. Yeah, I, I think, I think I'd, I'd speak to slightly outline that and to underline that and to also say that um, the more that something called a risk assessment committee is involved with a lobbying activity, the less objective its risk assessment is going to be thought to be. Chu, you're writing all these down to the really good points. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I would agree with, uh, very strongly with Oliver as an outside friend of what you're doing. And I think you should spend the next period of time, whether that's three months or a year, thinking uh, concretely about which issues you think are, uh, need to be addressed. And I think they're diverse, and I wouldn't lump them together. And I also think starting off immediately associating yourself with the biotech industry is not a very advisable way to go uh, for complex, multiple reasons. But you're, you want to position yourself at the cutting edge of biology, it seems to me. And retain your autonomy um, as a scientific enterprise, at least to, to start with. So there's that. And then I think you, as I know Roger and Drew and others will do, you need to think as well about the biosecurity issues, because I think that's actually one arena you're certainly going to have to face uh, in one fashion or another in, in the relatively um, near future. But I'm an advocate of the change the name first and then low profile <laughs> low profile for a while until you have a better sense of where you think um, what you what you think you need to worry about because I, I don't think that's specific enough yet and then I would urge you again to play this to call your to play the scientific advance and excitement about what you're doing as much as any promises for um, curing asthma cancer and the rest or cleaning up the environment and all this sort of stuff. This is a very exciting interdisciplinary scientific enterprise that needs to be encouraged on those terms, at least uh, for a start. John? That would... <laughs> I have... Drew, you got that? <laughs> I have a suggestion for name change. So. When I came to the field, I had a wrong impression of what synthetic biology does. I had the impression that it synthesizes biology. What people are doing is they are engineering present biology. So I think that biological engineering, by associative thinking of people who are, want to feel what's going on in the field, is hitting it more central than synthetic biology. It is not synthesizing biology. Yeah, I I have similar concerns about, I mean, the, the choice of a name is exciting and energizing in some senses. It may be scary in other contexts, and one has to be careful of that I issue. Think, uh, like two more questions. I just ask a specific question. Um, are there... Um, <coughs> yeah, I guess another... <laughs> another, another, uh, sorry, perhaps way to focus it is just, um, are there... Uh, Alternatives, or does, does this seem like a reasonable plan in outline, or is there some uh, other approach that people would suggest? I mean, I, every valuable comment should keep coming in, uh, but does this seem like a reasonable plan to go with? If I may consider this as a motion on the floor, I second yes. it. Thank you. The motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? <laughs> All opposed? Motion is carried. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, quite enthusiastic about uh, trying to proceed in this direction. We're then faced, if we try to do this with a somewhat more cumbersome and... Can I just suggest that uh, this is a budget testing committee. It's in, uh, uh, but uh, its uh, limit should be to assess the 
So, so it's an important point. I guess one of the, one of the uh, difficulties here is, is sort of the issue of, obviously, of how far we can see in the future. And, you know, and that's a, sort of a, a difficulty in terms of the opportunities. It's a difficulty in terms of the risks. And, and so I think the one idea of having a committee that keeps getting comments from people on a regular basis and meeting on a regular basis is the chance to sort of review ideas as one goes along. And, and so... I, you know, I would see a, a key thing to be, re, you know, a report next year of what what we see, and, and this would be one of the issues we'd look at. Drew, did you want to try again? <laughs> Wrap things up here. I mean, so, I, so I think there's been a motion. And so, so, the, as I understand it, there's a general acceptance of this plan to to try for a committee. And then we're faced with the more difficult question of and cumbersome process of deciding who should be on the committee. And we have, I think, on the next slide. Uh, a list of people that, you know, about five minutes of <laughs> consideration went into this morning. So the others question is very, very real, and it's also possible that there are names of people listed there who actually wouldn't be willing to, to serve on such a committee. So uh, the first question is if, <laughs> if any of the people who are listed there would not be interested in serving um, they should say so if they're here. <laughs> and uh, if there are suggestions on other candidates, that's a, a very uh, real issue, and it's something that we could consider now, and we can consider uh, you know, over the next uh, hour or so. The, the possibility would be to try to vote on a slate of candidates uh, at the end of the morning session. Uh, Samantha... Sutton has volunteered to help uh, collect nominations and uh, institute some democratic uh, procedures in this regime. So the idea is that we'll have a, a paper ballot before lunch. It will have some set of names listed on it, and we probably uh, ask people to vote for, what, five candidates? I guess would be the plan. So uh, if there are immediate suggestions of... Um, people who should be removed from this list or added to this list, uh, be delighted to take them for a minute or two, and then that process of uh, refining the list can, can continue and be discussed uh, certainly again after the break. Okay, so this list will hold for the, hold for the uh, moment, but again, uh, the whole idea is to keep getting comments and advice from people, including about this list. So. Uh, please uh, let uh, uh, Drew know, or Samantha. let me know, or Samantha. Uh, Samantha, can you read? Yeah. yeah. And she's going to be in charge. Thanks a lot. Okay, now I have a 10 to 15 minute introduction of Drew Endy, in, which will be required in order to tell you about all the wonderful things he's done. But I'm going to cut that short. Here's Drew. Okay, thanks. Okay, so. I'm going to introduce a framework that um, we've been developing as a group here at MIT over the last year and a half as part of the efforts of the Synthetic Biology Working Group, the IAP courses that we've been teaching during the January breaks. Uh, basically, this is a framework for um, beginning to think about how you might want to design and construct integrated biological systems so that um, we begin a process of transitioning from uh, making these very beautiful artifacts to a, a more systematic, uh, scalable process. So just to warm you up to the challenge, um, this is an example of um, a system that a group of students came in a couple days after we started a class last January. Uh, the theme of the class was to think about how you would program uh, a clonal population of cells to produce a pattern in space, much like we saw yesterday with Ron's work or Erotica's work. Um, 
This is the idea they came up with in a toy animation for the system. They called it the Ecolibrator. Um, somehow their thinking was that uh, you'd have a field of cells swimming about. One cell would spontaneously turn on. It would uh, secrete a signal that its neighbors would detect. Having detected the signal, the neighbors would respond to that by moving and forming a clump of cells. Um, a second signal would accumulate and at some point trigger a threshold response that would reset everybody and they'd go about their business. Um, so that's what they wanted to make. And the question that you're, you're faced with, given this, is uh, write down the DNA sequence that encodes this system and, and send it off to John so that he can make it. Right? And, that's, and that's a hard problem. Um, uh, the other approach you might take is uh, implement the screen or selection that you could give to Pim Stemmer so that he could use PCR shuffling to come up with a piece of DNA that comes up with the system. Uh, and that's a hard problem. It's a hard problem because there's many things going on here. It's a complicated system you're trying to implement, and the process of implementing it has many different steps. So another way of saying all of this is if you look at engineering of biology heretofore, it's mostly been this ad hoc process where you're going from a particular application you'd like to implement um, and immediately trying to start building it and designing it all in one thing and maybe you produce stuff called devices or systems and you know maybe it works at the end of the day. Maybe you get a, a plant that detects something in the environment and changes colors or maybe you don't. Right? It's a research process. You've not done it before. You don't know if it's going to work the first time. Uh, having done it once for this plant if you then want to get bacteria to do something for you or somebody else to deposit an interesting nanostructure, it's another research process. You're starting over. Um, and so we've got this workflow right now that produces beautiful artifacts, but they're really pieces of art, meaning that if you wanted to do it again, well, you just got to start over. Right? We, we don't have our tubes of paint yet. Um, so the idea is to implement a different process for engineering integrated biological systems. And, and so the way this works is you take the problem of design and you separate it from the problem of fabrication. You fabricate your systems out of reusable standard components that you can deploy in combination to make many, many systems. So that if you have any particular application you'd like to realize, it's not an ad hoc research process, but rather um, you're using things that you know work in combination and you just go make it work. And there's some technologies that are needed to do this. You need a bunch of design tools. Um, you need ways of organizing the descriptions of parts and the standards by which you assemble them and combine them. Uh, you need to coordinate de novo synthesis, and you need a whole bunch of work on the measurement side. Another way of saying all of this um, is we're trying to think about whether or not three past lessons from other engineering fields might be relevant to the engineering of biology today. So, Again, one of the lessons is standardization of components. Um, so mechanical engineering figured this out hundreds of years ago. It's nice to be able to go and get something off the shelf and make it work uh, without having to do a research process to find, find that. Uh, there's this idea called abstraction, uh, which is illustrated uh, in part in the transition from physics to electrical engineering. So the natural world has beautiful detail, the biological subset of the natural world in particular, and it's overwhelming. Right, so what are the relevant facts? What do we not need to worry about? And, and how do we separate um, a whole bunch of complex things into many simpler things that are easy to think about? Um, the last idea is that you could decouple the process of design from the process of fabrication. So if I wanted to build an 8-bit counter in yeast, I might need to know something about designing counters. You might need to know something about yeast genetics. Somebody else might need to know something about DNA binding proteins. Somebody else might need to know something about DNA synthesis, and so on and so forth. But not one person needs to know it all. right? So these are tools, basically, for taking complicated problems and separating them into many simple problems that can be worked on by more than one person or, or, or in series. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, an abstraction hierarchy that we've been developing for implementing integrated biological systems. This is only um, designed for dealing with systems based on gene expression, but it'll give you a sense for what you might think about doing in other domains. So the hierarchy, we're just going to call it, have three levels here, parts, devices, and systems. So what's a part? A part might be a, a DNA binding protein like ZIF-268 for mouse that Carl worked on. Um, and you might be able to use this to regulate processes on DNA. So we could have other zinc finger DNA binding proteins. We could have Wendell's um, uh, switchable proteins, and so on and so forth. A device might be a collection of functional genetic elements. 
So here we've got a DNA binding protein in the form of lactose repressor binding an operator on the DNA, uh, driving a ribosome binding site, a gene encoding bacteriophage lambda repressor, and a transcription terminator. So these are four functional genetic elements hooked up as a device. This device is an inverter or a NAC gate. And you can see that as follows. When this protein's input concentration is high, there's no transcription here. So the output is low. You're at this point on the transfer function. When the input concentration is low, you have transcription, so you have a high output, so you're here. Right? So that's an example of a device. Lots of other devices you could imagine. So you can black box it, say input is the protein, output is another protein. I've got a device. I can take these devices and hook them up into an integrated system. Um, in this case, I have three inverters in a ring. This should be an oscillator if I have good inverters. Right, so now I've got parts, devices, and systems, and, and there isn't so much to that, right? I mean, uh, you, could, you could sort of come up with that rather quickly. Uh, the thing that makes it valuable, um, or more valuable, is the idea that you have interfaces between the levels. And the way you get to your interfaces is to consider the idea of having these barriers, these impenetrable barriers that separate the levels in the abstraction hierarchy. And what this means is that somebody working at this particular level, say the device level, knows absolutely nothing about what's going on at the parts level, except for what you decide to tell them, what they agree to communicate about to people between these levels. Similarly, somebody at the systems level, they might need to know a lot about how you make oscillators, but they shouldn't have to know anything about how to make a good inverter, and certainly not anything about how a protein might bind DNA. Right? So think of these as impenetrable barriers, and then our job is to figure out how to best open up uh, channels in these barriers that let folks communicate across the levels. So I'll give you two examples of that, one at the parts device interface and another at the device system interface. So here's an example of, a, of an interface. We can call this the story interface, right? So imagine you're all working at the device level and you'd like some DNA binding proteins to make inverters, and I'm the parts guy. Right? And you go, hey, Drew, uh, give me a DNA binding protein. And I go, okay, have I got a DNA binding protein for you? This is bacteriophage lambda repressor, it's great. And I'm gonna tell you a story about bacteriophage lambda repressor, right? So, uh, a microbiologist in the early uh, 1900s was down in Mexico and he was noticing that a, a class of locusts were suffering from diarrhea and he could isolate the bacteria from those and when he plated those sometimes he found that there were clear spots in the, pla in the lawns of bacteria and these were uh, plaques um, and this was the discovery of bacteriophage. Um, and uh, about a decade later, others discovered that there were lysogenic bacteriophage, and then in 1951, Esther Lederberg uh, was able to identify lambda, and then Mark Tashney was able to show that lambda repressor bound DNA specifically, and we now know that lambda repressor is 236 amino acids and that it was a temperature-sensitive mutant, and if I had a big pile of lambda repressor on the table, and I, I painted it black, I'd have a big black pile of lambda repressor on the table, um, and so on and so forth, and I'm, I'm telling you a story. About, about lambda repressor, and some of those facts are relevant and others are not. Um, and wow, right, so, so, so what happens when you want another DNA binding protein, right? 80 years later, we have lambda repressor, and we have other things that I can tell you stories about. Um, and the stories are important, but they're also expensive. Um, and so if you wanted to make a system that had 100 DNA binding proteins in it, you would have to listen to 100 of my stories. Um, and you, know, you shouldn't want to have to do that. So this interface is, is, a, is a good interface um, only if, if, if you can handle all of the stories. The stories should be celebrated and they're important, but they're really only important down here. Right? So if we get this interface right, we celebrate and, 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 and reward the stories here, but, but we don't know about them up here. Right? So here's a different interface. Um, have I got a DNA binding protein for you? Uh, DNA binding protein A. It binds site alpha. Oh, you want another one? B to bind site beta, and so on and so forth. That's pretty good, right? it's a lot quicker. Um, and it almost works. The problem with, with what I just told you via that interface is I didn't tell you anything about whether A binds B or A recognizes beta, B site on the DNA. Right? So if I give you these two DNA binding proteins, you don't actually know whether they function together. So the interface we might want to implement is 
have I got DNA binding proteins for you, A, B, C, D, E, and so on, and they bind sites alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and so on, and not any of the other sites. And oh, by the way, the proteins don't interact with each other. And when I'm giving you this extra information, I'm giving you facts about the insulation of the components from one another. What that means is if you're up here at the device level, you can use any one of these proteins independent of the others within the context of being able to specify the relevant functional characteristics of the proteins, how quickly it binds DNA, how strongly it binds DNA, and so forth, the things that you might care about if you're a device person. Now, the point here isn't that there's any less work involved with getting this interface, right? It's a tremendous amount of work to implement uh, a set of self-consistent DNA binding proteins. It's more work than we might be doing otherwise. The point is, if we get the interface right, we only have to do this work once. Right? And then if we have such a set of proteins, we get to reuse them over and over again, and we know that, they're, that we've solved the problem, we can go on. So let's get standard components. Okay, here's another uh, example of an interface between two levels in the abstraction hierarchy. So a device system interface. So now say you all would like to implement uh, ring oscillators and you'd like three inverters, and I'm the inverter guy. And you go, hey Drew, um, give me three inverters. And I go, great. I've been working on inverters for the last two years. I've got three of them. Um, they've got real nice properties. They're fast, uh, good switching, and so forth. Um, uh, low latency. Uh, the first one takes in A and sends out B. And the second one takes in C and sends out D. And, and, the, and the third one takes in E and sends out F. Uh, these are the concentrations of proteins, right? It's protein inverters. Um, you go, thank you very much. And you put them up in your inverter, and you go, all of a sudden, huh, well, this is broken. Uh, because this inverter is sending out protein B and taking in protein E. Uh, did you make any inverters that take in A and send out E so I could, you know, we tried to make those and it, 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 they didn't work. Um, sorry. And this is broken here, so E to C, nope, couldn't make that, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I might make a bad joke and tell you that I can sell you a D to A converter, which takes in protein D and just converts it into protein A, right? But if I, if I actually started selling you those things, I would actually also have to make inverters that converted B to E and F to C and everything that I was using um, to send and receive signals, I'd have to have my own special signal converter, right? So this interface uh, is, 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 is broken, right? Meaning devices of this type can't be assembled in combination with each other. So let's look at this again, right? So this is a device, and it's taking in a pr protein, lac I, as its input, and it's sending out a protein, C1, as its output. Um, and the reason we're having problems hooking up these devices in combination with each other is because the carrier of the input and output signal is a specific biochemical, right? Lactose repressor, lambda repressor. And it, in this case, it might be the concentration of the protein. It could as easily be the concentration of the mRNA of the protein. It as easily could be the, the rate of accumulation of this protein, and so on and so forth. The problem with each of these is that it's of the protein, where the protein is some specific named protein. Right? My signal carrier's inputs and outputs are not fungible. You right? can't exchange them with each other. So the way you can fix this problem is basically by doing a register shift on the DNA. And you define your inverter in a different way. So now you start with a ribosome binding site. You have a gene encoding a repressor. Transcription stops at the terminator. And when expression occurs, the repressor operates at this site to stop transcription. Right? The input is going to be this thing called POPs, which is polymerases per second, the rate at which polymerases flow into the device. The transfer function is of the same form. When the pops in, when there's a lot of transcription coming in, I make repressor, and I don't have transcription leaving, high input, low output. When pops in is low, I don't make repressor. Other polymerase molecules combine here and leave, low input, high output. So just to look at this again, right? here's my pops-based device. Um, the polymerase is flowing along the DNA. If I were standing on this point in the DNA and just counting polymerase molecules going by, Right? There goes one, there goes one, there goes one, there goes one. It's the flow of polymerase along the DNA, like the flow of electrical charge along a wire. Um, when transcription comes in here, the genes expressed, repression occurs here, there's no transcription out. Right? Again, I could stand at this point on the DNA and count the polymerase molecules leaving, flow of, DNA along, flow of polymerase along the DNA. Um, my input and output signals are now carried by the same thing. I have a fungible carrier. Um, I can black box it and call it an inverter. I have my transfer function as before. And why this is cool is I can now take any source of POPs I'd like and put it up front, right? 
So it might be another inverter, it might be a popped battery that's just providing a constant level, it might be a switch, whatever you like. Um, this is an interface that if I structure my devices as such, I can compose them um, with impunity, basically. Um, so there are other things you can do with this. Um, so for example, you could have a fan-in device that accepts more than one input. So I could have pops coming in here, making this repressor protein acting at this point. I could have a second input terminal accepting pops at another point on the, on the DNA, making this repressor protein acting at this single output terminal. Right, and I can black box this, call it a two input NOR. I could have fan out, where I have a single pops in. Uh, this is an inverter, it's acting here. Oh, I have a second output terminal here, and I'm sending pops out at a different point on the DNA. And so on. And if I have these devices, again, I can hook them up uh, by just simply making this connection, sending the same carrier. So if I can convert my devices from carrying, using chemicals, specific chemicals as the carriers of information to the rate of transcription, then I have an interface that lets me use these in combination. And so if I sent you three uh, POPs-based inverters, you could hook them up ABC, you could also hook them up BAC, CBA, and so on and so forth. Right. Now, um, a couple points to make. One is that you know, the POPs interface depends absolutely on getting this interface correct. Right. If I don't get the specificity of my protein DNA interactions right to begin with, getting the POPs interface right won't do me any good because I'll have one POPs inverter over here, another POPs inverter over here, but the proteins within them might be cross-talking with each other. Right. So, so this interface depends absolutely on, on this one here. The second thing to say is, um, wow, we don't have a lot of experience with POPs and POPs-based devices yet, and there's, there's going to be a lot of work to be done to make sure that I can, in fact, hook one POPs-based device up to another up to any other, actually, and that composition always works. The point, again, is that if we get it working the first time, we don't ever have to get it working again. So now if you come back to the problem that I started with, right? here's a system you'd like to make or somebody shows up and they'd like you to make it for them. Write down the DNA encoding the system. With the abstraction hierarchy and the framework we just walked through, you now have got some tools uh, to make this go. Right? So we're just going to walk back down the abstraction hierarchy. So you start with that system you'd like to make, and you go, how am I to implement this as a, set of, as a collection of POPs devices? Right? So I have a trigger here that flips a coin and turns on at some finite rate. Uh, when it's on, it sends a POP signal out into this other device, a switch, uh, turning on the switch. When the switch is activated, it sends a POP signal that activates a reporter device. In this case, the reporter device is expressing CFP. It could be expressing whatever you want. Maybe you want to use LACZ, maybe you know, and so on and so forth. So pick your favorite reporter device. Or I didn't get a reporter device, but you did, so can I use yours? Um, the POP signal also goes into an attractor, which converts it into aspartate. In this case, aspartate leaves the cell and is received by this other device over here, which converts it back into a POP signal. The POP signal goes out, and if the switch isn't already on, it activates the switch. This is the recruitment of the neighboring cells. Meanwhile, another device here, which is always on, is powering the production of homoserine lacto, and Ron mentioned this yesterday. And there's a receiver device here, which, when this comes in, will convert that to a POP signal at some point and deactivate the switch. Right? So we just went from a just-so story of the system to a set of devices that could implement that system with that we had each of these devices. You can now go down one more level in the abstraction hierarchy and get to parts. And so here you're seeing the trigger blown up and revealed to be a set of five functional genetic elements. Uh, promoter, ribosome binding site, repressor, uh, transcription terminator, operator. And I could tell you a story about each of these parts, but I don't want to do that. Instead, I want to have um, standard biological parts, and they're indicated here by these numbers, C0012, R0034, and so on, right? Um, I can take these components and I can compile them down to the DNA, right? So if you wanted to assemble them or synthesize them, that might be the resulting molecule, right, encoding your system. I can implement uh, a timing diagram. You know, the whole standard set of tools that an engineer might use to describe a system. Uh, so you're seeing a legacy uh, description of the POPs, which we used to call TIPS. And, you know, one of the 
one of the stories, one of the points to make here is, you know, <coughs> protein concentrations are convenient to think about as input and output signals because we're familiar with them and we know how to measure them. Um, but as input and output signals for composable de devices, they're a disaster. POPs, right, is, is a great carrier of information, but we don't know how to measure it, right? So if you can figure out how to measure POPs, then we can just call it your name. Um, you know, so, you know, Elowitz is the leading candidate, I think, right now. So we'll call, we'll have like one megawitz inverters or something like that. Um, but anyway, so, 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 um, you know, a pop signal comes out of the, out of the trigger, goes into the switch, and so on and so forth. We're just getting a sense for how this might work. Um, you know, more standard tools where you can simulate the expected concentration of bacteria over space as a function of time. And importantly, you get to things like this. So you don't just have a specification of the system, but you have a specification of characterization and debug uh, devices. So how do I know my trigger works? Well, I take my trigger and I hook it up to a reporter device. Um, and I'm just going to see how often this thing is flipping a coin and I can detect its signal. Um, what's important about this part of the framework is here's where you want to plug in, as Ron was describing, uh, to the strengths, the complementary strengths of directed evolution, for example. Um, or other tools you could use to um, get the properties of this trigger to be what you would like, uh, to adapt the levels of the output signal so that they match the levels of the required input signal to your next device. Um, the framework of, of the abstraction hierarchy, parts, devices, and systems, and the correct interfaces is, is useful, right? Because it lets you get to complex integrated systems that you, we have no hope of evolving anytime soon, so far as I can figure. Um, And so I think I'll leave it with that and go back to you. interesting to do. The only thing I'm not confident in is that I understand what the costs are inside a cell. Um, well, you're just how many, um, you know, molecules of ATP it takes to uh, drive a polymerase at a certain frequency to make a transcript right. of a certain size. But, yeah, all, all, I'm, yeah, yeah. Like all I'm saying is many things, many things are mapped into POPs, and so, you know, whether you include, you know, the reset cost of uh, dropping down the protein level, for example. I, I just don't know all the things you would include in the, in the calculation. But yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting and, and would be fun to do. Yeah. I guess my question is, uh, at, at this level of abstraction, I think that you're going to run into lots of biological problems. And that you can talk about directed evolution, but evolution is not going to stop when you stop directing it. So uh, if you ignore what the repressor levels are, at some point, re high repressor levels are going to inhibit cell growth. Yeah. And so now you're going to have selection against these yeah. systems that you've so carefully yeah. put together. Yeah. And, and, and so if you don't, if you try to attract too much, you're going to lose the important information that allows the cells to, still to survive or to compete with their neighbors who have right. disabled your elegantly engineered right. switches. So this is, this is a great, great point. So this is, this is one part of what has to be a much more... Uh, a you know comprehensive framework for engineering integrated biological systems, right? You go back to Tom's power supply and chassis. We actually need to have cells that we understand how much load we can put on them and at what cost. So Jay actually had some of this in his talk where he was looking at reduced growth rates as a function of uh, gene expression. Um, we need a lot more information of that type. We also need to define things like standard operating conditions. So where are we defining our, 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 our parts and, and systems to work? Um, in E. coli uh, mid-log, on an agarose pad, in stationary phase, and so on and so forth. And then, just to zoom out more generally, 
there's a real fundamental challenge in, in the engineering of biological systems, which goes back to the design of self-replicating machines, things that make copies of themselves and make mistakes when they make copies of themselves. So this is where Mike Savage's work is, is of tremendous relevance to the things we're trying to do. Um, and wow, I mean, no other engineering discipline really has ever encountered self-replicating mach machines systematically, and here we have them. And so let's go. So, so I guess in, in, the, in the sort of the classical case of overexpression, the typical strategy is to, to, to make a system which you can turn on at a certain time and observe it for a certain period of time before evolution has a chance yeah. to, to take place. So, I mean, maybe that, that, it would that's be good fine, to build that's, these things. That's fine, but yeah. we may or may not want to be operating in that regime. Yeah. We may, in fact, want things to be functioning while the cells are growing, and we just have to solve that problem. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. The, uh, you had mentioned design, uh, decoupling design and fabrication. And from what I understand about manufacturing engineering, so there's, there's a, a movement, a paradigm of designing for fabrication, designing, manu designing for manufacturing. So it seems there's something in conflict there. Yeah, so, so you, you, maybe there's something to that, but you can also start with our current operated, operating practice, which is which, which design and fab are coupled, and the cost there is prohibitive. So you know, the best engineers of biology right now are spending lifetimes at the bench doing things that could be done much more efficiently. And so we, we're, we could be at risk of pushing too far, but we're at the one extreme right now, and so any movement is progress. I'm thinking about how to measure um, your POPs. I think you don't need to measure polymerases per second. You just need to measure, um, have a relative standard. For example, if you take a test tube system under standardized buffer conditions, standardized polymerase concentration, and you look at one reporter gene. And that's the mean to standardize all your POPs. And by those, you could um, compare all your um, um, POPs intensities. Could be the thing to do. And I want to point out that you're really making two suggestions. One is the technical suggestion, and the other is the suggestion that we all agree about how we're going to measure it. Uh, so that if you know one group in, in California makes a set of inverters and another group in uh, Maryland makes a set of inverters, you know, we know a priori whether they're going to work with each other or not. Hi. I just uh, heard several people talking about possible problems with systems like this because of unanticipated interactions between between things, as you pointed out over there, uh, loading problems, and over here somebody was talking about manufacturability and, and whether or not you can really separate these levels. And the answer, of course, is all engineering disciplines have these problems. Okay, the, the, these, this is a conceptual structure, and indeed the conceptual structure is essential for getting things under control. So that, but, but of course, in the very best devices, there are often quite a bit of overlap between functions that are intentionally put in. That's something, that's a refinement which makes things better, makes things work better often. On the other hand, when you plan something out, you need ideas like this to make it possible to deal, to, to how do you say it, to conquer the complexity of the problem. Turn, turn, turn. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to uh, ask a question about the inverter. Um, although the inverter does have a standardized input and output in the scheme, uh, the repressor involved in each inverter has to be um, unique. And um, eventually, at a fairly large number of inverters, you run into the problem of repress repressor sequence specificity, never mind the cost of producing the uh, repressor itself. Um, so what may happen is, as the, your sequence scales, um, not the sequence, the circuit scales, you end up um, running into possibly insurmountable crosstalk problems due to the sequence specificity of the repressor. Uh, have you thought of dealing with that problem? Yes. <laughs> I mean, to, but to give you some more information on that, I mean, I, 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 you know, Carl's one of the world experts on this, you know, issue of how many um, <laughs> DNA binding proteins could you get into a cell working as a self-consistent set with, you know, at some specificity. Um, and I, I don't know if you still believe this number, but the number I remember, Carl, was something like a thousand DNA binding proteins with of order one percent crosstalk. I mean, it was—it felt like it was to. The, you, I think the, the offhand remark was you're more you're worried about the cells having enough zinc Is that or something. I think one can make a quite a reasonable argument that one could add a thousand such proteins. That, 
you know, the number of possible combinations of it, as, as Carlos uh, laid out in his talk, there's a very large number of possible six-figure proteins. And if one chose a, a set um, for, uh, so, so you'd have to choose a set, so you target 18 base pair sites, you'd want a thousand such 18 base pair sites, each of which were significantly different from any other one in that set, and you can do pretty well on that score. And then you'd have to have protein for each site with the expectation to have minimal plus reactivity with the other sites. But I want to I want to come back to something, right? I mean, this is the I think I think Ron's um, uh, automata system is is, to my knowledge, the most complex integrated system that's ever been built, and we really don't know how f complex we can make things within the substrate that the cell provides, right? So Michael uh, has a, a an idea of a system he calls the repressathon, right? Which is you just daisy chain inverters over and over again and you see how deep you can push a signal, right? What's the limit using natural components? What's the limit using um, synthetic components that are optimized to have better properties, right? And th th there's a whole bunch of stuff you'd like to know the answers to that we're just gonna have to go figure out. So Drew, one, one last, yeah. I, was, I don't know who, who else has a question. Um, so in the definition of POPs, it, is, is, does POPs refer to the uh, um, polymerase rate of synthesizing the internal regulator completely so like if you're synthesizing or, or is it just the transcription rate period the second thing you said just the transcript just the rate at which the polymerase molecule crosses a point on the DNA okay so then the question that they had about about each each element being unique um, it still raises I guess some timing issues I suppose I does that come out in your well, simulations? So, so if you want a device, you need to specify the relevant characteristics of the device as a user of the device, and then somebody has to go make it, or you have well, to go find it. What, what, no, what I mean is like, what I mean is that each time, you, 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 since you'll have a group of unique inverters, and unique um, not gates, and I mean unique and gates, and, and whatever, um, you, each time you want to use one of them, you're going to have to make sure their timing is compatible with the others. So you're going to have to have yeah. timing compatible yeah. sets, right? Sure. And so that would be one of the, that would, and that's one of the reasons that I assume that even, that you're even doing more thinking about trying to come up with even more uniform elements that might actually go yeah. to the next level of abstraction. Right. I mean, this, this is just an example, right? I mean, the, the reason it's, I think it's worth doing this now is because the amount of work involved is, is, is so overwhelming that we have to get it right the first time. Uh, that would be good if we could. Okay. Okay. So thank you, Drew. Okay, so I, when I came to MIT, worked with Drew, I believed all of that. I thought this was a wonderful plan. Uh, then what's the next step? Well, there are two paths. One path is go into the lab, next five years, uh, Work out the details of everything. Think of everything you can imagine that might go wrong. Pin it all down. Do careful analysis. <sighs> Exhausting. There is a different way that we've taken, and that is we imagined the future. We went forward with great speed, and we stumbled some, but we actually stumbled on the things where we had to stumble instead of stumbling on things where we didn't have to stumble. So one of the things we did was, uh, it's also the case that we have three real computer architect kind of people, Tom, Jerry, and, and myself. And so when we came at this, we thought, well, obviously, you know, there must be like the bio data book. And when we were young, we were able to look in a book. I, I didn't bring one along today. I moved my office and the book's in boxes somewhere. Uh, there were books that described in details parts that you could buy from semiconductor manufacturers. And there was a page on each part, and it talked about what the pins were, what the signals were, what function it did, and it was all engineered to work together, and this was all great. And I, and I went to Tom's lab, and I saw that he had all of these catalogs. I said, oh, this must be the data book collection of biological parts. And it was the collection of flasks and tubes and all of those things. So we said, oh, there's work to do. So we began by making the MIT, it wasn't called this at the time, the MIT Registry of Standard Biological Parts. Uh, one might note that this is just the MIT one, there can be other ones. Uh, it's supposed to be like the parts data book. And in the parts data book, you have the information you need in order to be able to make use of parts. 
It also, as a data book, when you want to do something, you look in the data book and say, is there something that I could use to do that? And if you're lucky, then it's there. On the other hand, if you're a supplier, suppose that you and your buddy want to leave school, go to your garage, and make biological parts, you need to have a way to, to offer them and sell them. And so you can put them in the data book and sell them or give them away or whatever. The second thing is that given the state of DNA technology today, you really need to have a repository. And the repository is like the gold repository at Fort Knox, right? It actually has the things in it. So we have uh, a repository and we're doing things with that. The other thing you need is you need to have a way to put these parts together, characterization of the parts, and all this develops into a user community. So before break, I'm going to go through and show the repository to you, excuse me, the registry to you. And we're just kind of going to fly through and see what's in there and what's it about. Uh, you'll find the registry at parts.mit.edu, and then it'll take you to this other place here. Uh, the front page looks like this. Okay, you can see the data book. We took the data book and we fixed the title, the MIT BioBricks data book. Uh, there are a variety of things here that are of interest. Down here, take a look at them. Uh, the main core of the parts registry is that we actually have a SQL database uh, in the back end that has all these parts in it, all this information, and then this uh, all runs off of that. Uh, there are a variety of different kinds of parts. We have regulatory parts. Uh, that's my own choice of terms because promoters that inhibit seem weird to me. But there's promoters and inhibitors and activators and those kind of things there. Uh, ribosome binding sites, protein coding regions, uh, reporters. We have transcriptional terminators. We have some inverters. Composite parts made up of other parts put together. Uh, IAP project parts. We have a few parts that are RNA interference kinds of parts, some cell-cell signaling parts, things that are protein generators and takes tips or pops in and put out proteins, uh, measurement parts. We also have some things, I, I separated them a little bit. Uh, we have some primers that are useful when you're using our system. There are some plasmids that are able to carry the parts, and there are some strains of cells. If you if you have a lot of time, you might just want to look at the whole parts list. And so here's the whole parts list. All the parts are in here. We show, interestingly enough, the name of the part. I also sometimes call it the part number because of the part number parts useful. This summarizes everything. This is the index into the registry. So if you want to label something that you're using, instead of calling it you know, lambda such and such from such and such a strain with a modification here and a modification of the story, you just use the number, okay? Then you can put the number into the database. You can actually type it over here if you want to go right to it, and you can find out all about it. We have a fair number of parts specified in the database, and I'll kind of scroll through here a little bit. Everybody reading as I go here? It kind of goes and goes. The parts with the A on the left are actually available. The ones with a green box next to the, uh, next to the left uh, are ha actually working. We have some parts here. These are parts that were done during one of the IAP classes. We haven't assembled them yet. Here we have a lot of protein generators that are available. Here we have some composite parts that work, some inverters, some regulatory regions. Okay, all together we've got the uh, order of 800 parts specified. There's uh, about 500 parts or, or so that are actually put together in some way. You can, since that list is too long, you can actually go and jump directly to things. So here are transcriptional regulators. And these are they both tell you the name of the part and they tell you things about where it came from. And you see a lot of these have been tested to some extent or used and they work. Uh, one of them actually doesn't work very well and one of them has issues. The issue here is that 
the cells don't really like it and they tend to mutate it. So you got to watch out. This chart also has uh, other information. It does tell you where, briefly where and, and what the name of it is uh, for the convenience of the biologists in the group. And it has a little bit of parameter information. Let's just show you the, the whole list uh, about the output high and low levels. It tells you how long the sequence is. We have similarly some ribosome binding sites. We mostly use the Elowitz one. We have some others we, which are name strong, medium, weak, and weaker, which might not have anything to do with what they actually do. Uh, and we have a fair number of protein coding regions. And these are, most of them have a degradation tail attached, and we're making a collection that also don't have degradation tails attached. It's not, the, the, the box is blank. So if people use them and it works, tell us and we'll make it green. Okay? Uh, we have transcriptional terminators. Uh, and this is an area where we've done some experimentation and you can click on the, the box and see uh, exactly what we did in terms of experimentation. But a transcriptional terminator, for example here, B0011, uh, is based on a a particular biology, it's bidirectional, we've measured it, it's not very good, it blocks tr transcription about half the time in each direction. Uh, better transcriptional terminators are, for example, this one here, B0015, which is actually a combination of two transcriptional terminators, and it blocks at 98% of the time. So there's a variety that you can choose from. We actually made them in both directions. That's why there's a reversed version. So if you actually are needing to block transcription on the other strand, use the reversed version. What's the well, that's a really bad terminator because it promotes in the other strand. <laughs> so there's engineering work to do, right? You can look at one of these parts. Uh, let's pick a bad part that actually has a nice description. Uh, and you can click on these parts anywhere. You'll see the, uh, a picture of what's in the part, the stem loop. You see the sequence. Maybe. maybe. Uh, is that a little bit better? There. There's a picture of the M-fold version of this. Information about what the efficiencies are like. And I don't know that that actually matches up with the table. Uh, there are other things in here. There's notes, which are design notes. What people did to it. They may have made some modifications to the DNA. Uh, and there's always who designed it and uh, who owns it in terms of ability to access things in the database. A part that's more interesting is the inverter. And Drew sh showed you pictures of these quad part inverters. And I wish my screen was actually the same size as my liquid crystal screen. But we have a fair number of these quad part inverters. There are these Q parts, mostly. Some of the IAP classes made their own parts here. And you can see that they have more information about them. They have the name of the part. They have the input section, because these have fan in. And when you use the fan in, you get NOR gates. Okay, So if you want a bunch of NOR gates, here's a bunch of NOR gates. Uh, they also have the output section, so that you can have fan out. We tell you what the RBS is, but really, if you're a, a user of these parts, you shouldn't care. And it tells you whether it has a tag or not. Now, over here, we have this, this nice section of the chart. Okay? And in this nice section of the chart, we're going to write down what the performance properties of this part are based on pops in, pops out. Uh, we've done some measurement, particularly of the output high level, which is, it turns out to be a very important one, and I'm hoping that we'll, you know, at least get some of that information in pretty quickly, and then we can make it better. Okay. 
When you get to the projects parts, and this is a little bit because we have so many of the schools involved in the competition, you can see the work that the different groups did, and you can look at the parts that they used. So for example, here's the polka dorks Ecolibrator project, and here are all the parts that they designed, specified, had synthesized, had built. So one thing that is kind of interesting here is there's really a lot. And you think about that this is what students did for three and a half weeks in January, five students. They specified a lot of parts. Behind every one of these parts, there's description, biology. They've done the literature work and all of that. Uh, for parts that they wanted to, that are test parts, they've specified uh, what those test devices, excuse me, what those test devices or test systems should be built out of. There's another section to the registry, and the other section deals with assembly. I have to log in here. The assembly section is about the other service the registry provides, which is putting the parts together into systems. And I'm going to talk some more about that after the break, but I just wanted to give you a little taste of it. We have here a variety of assemblies that have been done. The big, long one was this one. This is all of the parts. Here's the list of all the parts that two of the groups from the 2003 class uh, wanted to have assembled. And there's actually quite a lot inside some of these things. You can see this one has inside it seven pieces, and those pieces are compound, are, are complex pieces. This, for example, is another part that is, is to be assembled. We did that in a, now everybody squint a little bit, right, because I've got style sheet stuff going on with HTML in different browsers, right, so this isn't, everything doesn't actually line up quite right. But this shows you the amount of assembly that has to be done to put together all of the parts desired by two teams. And every one of these is a part that needs to be assembled. You'll notice that, that a lot of them actually have to wait until something else is built. And then at the very end, uh, the pieces can be put together. This is actually, you have to build this piece here, and then you can put the little piece on the front of it when it's ready. And there's a, a fair amount of assembly that has to go on to, to build all of that. There's even more coming. I think I'll stop that. The way this assembly is done is in a parallel assembly fashion that's stage by stage. And Jen and Caitlin do it. And so in one stage, which is a whole lot of tubes at the same time, they do all of these pairwise assemblies. Okay. That works or doesn't work, and they move on to the next stage. I'll be talking about that some more after the break. So the registry is available online. Uh, anybody can look in the registry and see anything that's going on. We're not keeping anything private. This is kind of open source biology. Uh, if you want to change things, then you have to get an account, and uh, mostly we won't give it to you. If you uh, are part of the summer competition or one of the teams or one of the groups that we're really working with, then, yeah, we'll work on that. Okay? So for the rest of the morning, we now have a break. Uh, I'll ask, take questions. But we now have a break. And then we're going to come back, see a tool that we use that, that will be available along with this. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, I'm going to tell you some more about the registry and our, our, the principles behind it. And then we're going to have a little panel composed of the principles from each of the students in each of the student teams in the summer competition. Questions? Thank you. Can people like from Europe order stuff of this <laughs> shelf? So there's two answers to that. The first is that we are still in an early stage, and so we're providing things to people who are in the competition right now. We're not just opening it up to have everybody who wants it. Uh, the questions of can somebody from Europe order it will you know, really be based on you know, what the laws are regarding that, uh, you know, and that kind of thing. 
we're not quite there yet, but I certainly view this as something that in the longer run, uh, it's two things. Right now, it's being supported by NSF and DARPA and other people during the, uh, during the competition. After that, you know, it would be nice if it becomes more and more popular. If it becomes more and more popular, then we have to figure out, are we going to charge some amount for it? Do you have to join? Do, is there a, you know, a membership fee? Are we able to run it for free? I don't know. I don't know any of those, any answers to any of those questions right now. Another possibility is that we create a network of registries and one of the networks is in Europe. One of the, the nodes in the network is in Europe and in fact you get it from your local registry. We don't know yet. There's a few comments and about the registering question. I mean, isn't there some redundancy between uh, composite parts and IAP and uh, parts generator and et cetera, et cetera? That's right. Yes, there, the naming structure in all of this has redundancy. Uh, what we did was, and this is for the student teams mostly, each student team was given a range of numbers that they could freely allocate as they wanted. But parts that people really want to use you know, like if you want a coding region, it's supposed to be one of the C parts called a CDS. Uh, we haven't done a completely good job of moving things that were in IAP into CDS and dealing with that. But that's why all of the part numbers are BB little a. The A means it's an alpha part number not released yet. And we may run a kind of collection of temporary part numbers and then when, we, when they're proved to be good and useful and consistent, then we might move them over to the real released version. Another one, uh, when you say there are issues, okay, let's say I go to the registry and want to find a part. How there are issues? How do you figure out what issues and what does work, doesn't work mean? Contact the registry for more details. Yeah, but where is it going to be? I mean, is there already, will it be there in the near future? I, I think the, the right way to do that is to let the people who have the issues put the notes uh, associated with the part. So you can go read about the experiences people have had with the parts. And regarding the same stuff, we had some issues with vibrates. They like don't cut properly, etc., etc. et cetera, et cetera. Where so, could you put this kind of comment, like you know, PU, part Q0, 1400, they don't cut or whatever? But we'll have to distinguish between the things that are problems with the parts and things that, that the different teams need to learn how to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. At, at what stage do you envision having an additional layer of uh, circuit design software, or is that something you'll talk about later? Uh, immediately after lunch, excuse me, immediately after the break, you'll be seeing some circuit design software. How's that? That's a pretty good answer. Um, one really fundamental issue, I think, with this scheme of assembling modular parts is that the modularity in these systems is not perfect. And uh, the functions of the parts may not be independent of their sequence context. In other words, what other parts are next to them? And um, it just seems to me that a really important issue that needs to be addressed is either can we find a scheme whereby uh, parts could be insulated from one another or where modularity can be improved or, uh, you know, just to somehow, I mean, I think before, it might be something you want to do uh, before building up a gigantic library is figuring out what the conditions are for the pieces in that library to actually w function together. Right. We thought about that during the very f the 2003 IAP class and one of the students was pretty excited about it and so designed a spacer part. So we have a part that you can put in between which is designed not to do anything. Now, it, right, but at least it doesn't m-fold, it doesn't have, it doesn't have homology with anything that's in, uh, it blasts against nothing, all those things. But you're exactly right. The issue of the layers of extraction is something that, number one, we have to try to enforce and create. And secondly, it will be imperfect. And we're going to have to know about the imperfections. The, it is possible, however, that you might have a part that really, it always depends on what's next to it. And maybe it expresses its protein really, really high, or maybe it's toxic to the cell. And maybe that's a part that we ought to mark a red X with of don't use this part in our biobrick systems until you figure it out. So uh, could you include an online forum, perhaps, 
so you could discuss the problems with a part or uh, possible improvements or new parts or I mean it would like be easier idea. to you know talk about I like that idea yeah mm -hmm. good idea okay any more nope okay thank you what we're going to do until lunch. Uh, we had a question uh, I didn't have to pay very much to have asked about uh, design tools. And so Jonathan is going to show us BioJade, uh, which is a design tool that you can use for doing this kind of system design. Uh, then I'm going to talk some more about the registry, the principles assembly. And then we're going to shift into uh, section where we talk about the activities, the IAP classes and the summer competition. And we're going to finish with a panel up here at the front with all of the, with leaders from each of the uh, student teams that are involved in the summer competition. So if you're one of those five people, stick around. We're going to need you. Go ahead, Jonathan. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about BioJade. Uh, I've been working on BioJade for about a year and a half. You've heard from Randy and Drew and Tom about the usefulness of putting together these standard biological parts. And BioJade is a convenient and I think pretty easy to use way to do it. So BioJade has a few uh, simple components. There are five of them. The first layer is the schematic design, uh, which is laying out a genetic system uh, with a, a electrical circuit model. The second uh, layer is a functional network layer. This allows you to tune your model and prepare it for simulation. The third layer is simulation. We have a few simulators implemented so far, and uh, the architecture is flexible enough so that you can add simulations uh, of varying complexities. Uh, there's the DNA view, which allows you to see an annotated DNA view of your system. It shows uh, a linear piece of DNA as well as the actual sequence. And uh, I think John Mulligan would like it if you just be able to push a button and send it off to Blue Heron to build it. And finally, there's this icon interface layer, which allows you to give a graphical representation to your device and attach terminals to it with which you can use that device in a more complicated system. So I've built a rather uh, complicated system in, in the schematic mode here. Uh, you can see we have a receiver, uh, inverters, a whole bunch of them, uh, some OR gates, and reporters. And when I first made this design, these inverters just say inverter. There's no part assigned to them. And you can take this list of parts on the left side here, and these are prototype parts that have an icon representation, and you've perhaps worked on them in the past. And you can just drag and drop them onto your design, and then grabbing this wire tool, put wires in between the different terminals. And when you're all done, you push this handy-dandy little button here, the compile button. And at that point, what it does is it goes out to the parts registry, which, as you'll remember, is backed by a SQL database, and finds parts that satisfy this design. So it will find uh, all sorts of different inverters. It'll find your OR gates. It'll find reporters. And it will attempt to match them such that, uh, say, inverter BBA I9001 uh, is designed not to interfere with I9002 or any of the other inverters here. And it'll go through until it finds a system that all works together according to what you have. And of course, when you build it in the lab, it may not. But hopefully it will. And it'll give you a nice little list of these parts here that your system is composed of and list the part, individual parts that it's assigned. Once you have that description, you can move to the functional network uh, motif. And this shows you segments of DNA. These are only segments that have to be together. You can arrange them arbitrarily. And we have several things that you can configure here. For instance, the ribosome binding sites, as depicted here, uh, you can select. So 
say you want to try strong, medium, weak, weaker RBSs in different systems, you can set those up. And you can set the terminators. And so the rest of this uh, mode shows the promoters. You can see here, not very clearly, um, there are different binding sites for uh, activators and repressors. And the long sequence here are the coding regions. And there's this concept of, of grounding down here, which simply represents degradation of mRNA and the protein product. And one of the interesting things that you can see over here is these outputs are tied together. They both produce the same protein. And that protein goes up here and interacts with this promoter. And it goes over off the other side of the screen and interacts there. You can also, in this uh, motif, and I don't have on the screen, you can add additional species like IPGG and reactions, uh, IPGG interacting with some other uh, species on your system. And you push a button that says uh, generate sequence uh, on the previous slide, and it'll come up, go to the database, find all the parts, string them all together uh, in the order you've laid out, and you'll have this nice little DNA sequence. And you'll also have a listing of the BioBrick parts. And you can take that list. It'll send it back to the database along with your part. And you can go into the assembly tool that Randy created and simply assemble that part. In addition, there's simulations that you can use. And the simulations are based on a distributed model. So you keep track of what simulation tools are available on your system. There are two types right now. Stochasterator, which uh, Drew and some people at Molecular Sciences uh, worked on, and Tabasco, which was worked on by Sri Kusuri and uh, Jason Kelly in ND Lab. And you can specify the server that they're running on. These are all running on, on local host. And in addition, you can see all the results in the database. So there are four stochasterator simulations that are available there. And you can look at the output, which looks something like this when it works right for a repressilator. And you can see the oscillatory behavior there. In addition, there's uh, Tabasco, which I mentioned. And Tabasco generates movies. And one of the great features about the uh, distributed simulation idea is that you perform the simulations remotely, and then it saves all the data. In, in particular for this, it saves this uh, QuickTime movie into the database. And if you're accessing it from the web, you can click on that uh, simulation file, and you can see what was going on there. <coughs> so in the future, we need more ro robust simulations. And, and most importantly, we need data for simulations and modeling. If you noticed on the website, uh, we don't have parameters yet for the parts. We don't have the switching characteristics. We don't have the input low, input high, output low, output high. And all of that is going to make BioJade a lot more robust. And, and one thing I plan on doing soon is adding metabolic modules so that you can sort of integrate control systems along with uh, metabolic activity of cells. So BioJade's contributed, I think, some key tools to synthetic biology. It's a good design and simulation tool. and the data model backs both the BioBricks repository and, uh, and BioJade. And BioJade is now available to download at rosalind.csail.mit.edu slash BioJade. It's, it's very beta, probably alpha. And uh, you can send me bug reports. Uh, my email's on there, and there will be plenty of them. So I'd like to take, thank my advisor, Tom Knight, Randy Rettberg, Austin, Shri, and the NSF grant for the biology competition, and uh, the AI lab. Questions? Does a, does a part have to be in the repository for you to use it? Um, a particular instance of a part does not yet need to be in the repository. If you want to use it, it, it does. But you can you know, model your parts before they're actually in the repository. OK. Email. It's something. Uh, 
Um, in the repository, if, uh, Randy, are you going to show editing parts? Uh, I wasn't going to at this point. Well, what, if, you, if you have an account on the repository, you can go into a part and edit uh, the characteristics of that part. And that's something that we, we would hope that other people can do because it's an awful lot of work and we can't do it all. What, what platforms does it run on? It's written in Java, so it runs on anything that Java 1.4 is on. And there are two distributions, one in a zip and one in a disk image. Okay. Great, thanks. thanks. Getting there. Ah, okay, good. So this is where we left off before the break and before the little demo of the registry. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about the philosophy of the registry and what it does. Uh, one of the things that it does, it has physical parts in it. And this is what physical parts look like. They're in tubes. We use colors so that it's more neat. Uh, we've made a distribution of about 240, 250 parts uh, to the members of the summer competition for use during the summer competition. Uh, we've done that. People have asked questions about, well, can I get them? You know, are you distributing them to everybody and all of those things? Uh, I want to answer it kind of once so everybody understands. The we are ahead of ourselves in this entire activity, and that's a fine place to be. What we're doing is we're making up parts, we're distributing them, and the answer is no, we're not distributing them to everybody, we're distributing them to a limited set so that after we've done that and other people are interested in it, we can then talk to the lawyers and figure out how we ought to actually do this so we don't get in trouble and nobody else gets in trouble and all of that. If you talk to the lawyers before that, then you spend all your time talking to the lawyers and you never do the distribution, right? So. We're kind of managing the lawyer piece of the world. Uh, we have the idea that there'll be more than one distribution. There's also the idea, see, it's the MIT distribution. Uh, that's not advertising. That's to say, this is the one that came from MIT April of 04. Uh, when Caltech opens its registry, if they do, or when Europe opens their registry, if they do, they'll put their own identification into that. Uh, as I said, we have now in the registry about 300 parts that are listed as available. Uh, we have specified over 800 parts. Uh, many of those are compositions of other parts. And some parts are, there, there's an additional roughly 150, 200 parts that are actually the intermediaries during the assembly process. So if somebody else wants to build something, so it may already have been built during some previous assembly. We keep those around and keep track of them. Now, these physical parts are very nice now. I like them. They're tangible. I used to be a hardware guy, right? So that's a neat thing. But you know it's a limited window during which these parts are a good idea. You know, I, made, I used to be a CTO of the storage this division of Sun, and so I had my standard CTO chart, which is log of good and time. And then it goes up, right? That covers almost everything I ever needed while I was a CTO. Uh, and so here we have how many base pairs you can afford or how many base pairs your grad student can afford. Down here, you can't afford hardly anything. And so the, the grad student gets to look at DNA and has a very, very hard time doing anything with it. In the middle, you can get little pieces of DNA and you can get primers. Maybe you can get, you know, you can do a little bit of library stuff and all of that. That's kind of nice. During this phase, having physical, tangible pieces of DNA in convenient tubes is going to be really good. Later, who would mess around with that? You know, you just send it out, and then Blue Heron or some other company, you know, makes this thing. Yes, it's two megabases long, and it takes three weeks, and you get it. And at that point, the tubes and the freezers that we all have that are full of pieces of DNA in different forms they just become less valuable. This has happened to the semiconductor industry. For quite a long time, being able to buy a part with pins on it that you could then assemble into systems was really, really useful. Mostly it's gone past that. 
mostly the systems are all completely inside apart. And so when you look inside a PC, instead of seeing hundreds and thousands of parts, there's not very many, and that let the PCs get smaller, and that was very good. When that happens, the information about what to build in detail is still important. So the information of what sequen sequence you would use to get a particular coding region with this particular set of properties is still valuable, and that's still going to be in the registry. So I think the database lives on even after the distribution uh, of physical parts has ended. Now, if you have these physical parts, uh, like we do, how do you put them together? And so I'm going to show you briefly how we do that. It's normal, normal cloning techniques with a little twist. I'll show you the little twist. So our parts, here's a nice pretty part. This is a blue part. It's on a red plasmid. There's an antibiotic resistant gene. There's a terminator on both sides. Uh, one would hope that it's a good terminator so that what's in the part doesn't leak out, what's outside the part doesn't leak in. Okay, all normal. Uh, we have uh, four restriction sites that are important, uh, ECHO-R1, XBUS, B, and PST. And they're shown up here. I, this is for my convenience, because I can't ever remember what they are. I'm sure the biologists have them memorized and think, dream about them in their sleep. Uh, we have here a blue part and a green part. If you cut this plasmid with E and S, you get a little piece, throw away the rest. You cut the other part with E and X, throw away the little piece in between. You mix them and ligate them, and what happens is that this piece goes into the plasmid, and you now end up with something that goes EX, eh, I'll skip that, SP. And in the middle are the two parts put together. Now, the neat thing is that when I put the the uh, sticky ends of S together with the sticky ends of an X like this, it turns out that, see, X and S have the same sticky ends. So they will glue together. Once they've glued themselves together, the result can't be cut by either one of them. So this new site, this mixed site, as we call it, is now a join that will not be cut by future versions of this process. So what we've produced is, we, well, we started with two parts in plasmids, and what we got out was a part in a plasmid that can be used in exactly the same way that the other parts were used. This means we can put anything in front of anything else, and what we get we can use as parts in later assembly steps. So when we do an assembly, we do it in parallel. I think I deleted too much. So I wonder where it is. So if you wanted to assemble these, please ignore for the moment the PowerPoint problem and ignore this for the moment. If you want to put A, B, C, D, E, F together, what you would do is you would put A and B together, C and D together, E and F together, and do that all at the same time. Okay? That would take you three days to five days. Then you would take A and B and put them together, and you, you'd wait with the ENF because you only had six parts. And after you have A, B, and C, and D, you would put A, B, C, D together with EF and have A, B, C, D, EF. You could do it in three stages. Okay? So much better, six parts. Instead of being forced to do that in five stages, I can do it in three stages. Many of the student projects had as many as 30 parts in them. So clearly doing them all in a row would be a big problem. Uh, doing them in parallel is good. It turns out that there's a nice thing about this parallel assembly, which is sometimes the assembly doesn't work. Has anybody ever had that experience? Okay. So if it doesn't work, then when you, as a result of this stage of assembly, when you replan, the system will plan in a different way. And it turns out that in the case like this, it will simply make DEF, which it was never going to make before, and ABC that it was never going to make before and then it can glue them together, and it still takes only three stages. Okay. This is nice. We find that this happens all the time. Also, if we have a lot of student projects all being processed at, at the same time, we do all of these steps in parallel all together. And uh, I don't know if Drew has figured out exactly what our capacity is uh, with the technicians right now, whether we're able to do 40, 50 assemblies a week or 30 assemblies a week, something, something in that range. Is it figured out, Drew? 
about that. Okay, I've been vague enough. It's, it's probably true. So one of the things that you get from the registry is the ability to have your systems assembled. And you tell us what you want, you make parts, you send us an email, and then we work on it and put it together and send it back to you. Again, that's decoupling the fabrication from the design. That way the people can focus on what should the design be and then focus on the measurement. So we've looked at the next question of parts characterization uh, in, some, uh, in some detail in, in a lot of discussions. This is the, pic this is the model of uh, terminators. And for terminators, we've measured how well the transcription got through. We were able to do that as a relative measurement of uh, two fluorescent proteins before and after the terminator. Uh, seems pretty believable because the system's very consistent. The puzzle is, what do you do about uh, more complex measurements? We'd like to measure tips directly. We also need to measure tips in a particular environment. We have to say, what is the standard operating condition for our measurement? And it turns out that that seems obvious and is, I think, actually quite difficult right now. It seems obvious because you say it like this. Well, standard operating condition will be such and such a cell strain, such and such a temperature, such and such a media. And with that, it should all be consistent and reliable all the time, right? Well, maybe not. If, for example, you let the cells grow in a tube of media, they eventually, you know, they eventually starve, and the operating condition changes pretty dramatically. Right? If we're growing them on an agarose pad on a microscope, that's not the same as being in, this, in a tube. So there's an idea that you can hold the conditions constant and they will all do the same thing. Some of the, the presentations and posters have indicated that even if you hold all the conditions constant, it still doesn't do the same thing. So maybe we aren't holding the right conditions constant. We don't know what conditions to hold constant. It might be more like saying that I, I have some transistors here I have three transistors. Their standard operating conditions are, this one is standard operating condition is in a car. This one is standard operating condition in a computer. And this one is standard operating condition in a television set. The, engine, the, the electrical engineers in the audience will say, huh? Wow. That misses most of the interesting things, like temperature, voltage, current, you know, car, computer. Eh, this isn't going to really, this isn't going to work. And it's possible that we're too removed from standard operating conditions when we think about just the media that it's in, the temperature that it's at, even the stage of growth that it's at. We may need to say standard operating conditions are plenty of amino acids, plenty of ribosomes, particular concentration of polymerase. And then the question is, how do we hold that operating condition constant? It can be hard. We have the other problem, of course, of how do you measure the POPs themselves. And as I told people over the break, uh, we think about it as this is 2004. We must know how to do this. You know, this is going to be kind of pretty easy. Uh, but actually, it's more like electronics in the 1850s, where Ohm, everybody's heard of an Ohm, the unit of resistance, right? So Ohm wrote his paper. He wrote that in, I think, around the 1820s in German, okay? So the scientists who are doing electri electrical work in the 1850s, they say, unit of resistance. I have this really neat current impeder, and it is about four inches long, quarter inch in diameter, made out of carbon from Johnson Mine number one. It's a really good one. And I, by the way, it's well specified, okay? It's exactly four inches long. I have this other one you might like. And this one is very good in cars. We don't have any cars yet. And this one is an eighth of an inch in diameter, two inches long from Johnson Mine number two. After Ohm's paper gets translated, then we're able to say, ah, measure it in ohms. Here's the standard for an ohm. Okay. So whoever figures out how to do all that gets the unit named after him. <laughs> you might have to be dead by the time, but it's okay. It's not bad. It's not bad. Okay? So now, I'm going to come back and hit a nail on the head again to make sure it's pounded in pretty thoroughly. 
Okay? And that is this inverters and pops. Now, obviously, all the biologists think about it, and, and the presentation so far uh, have been on the idea that an inverter takes in a protein, puts out a protein, right? And it has a nice curve. And so if you have two, pro two inverters and they're connected together, they better have the same protein in between them, right? Uh, we know that we need to have insulation, right? The insulation will keep the proteins apart, right? If you're using more than one uh, protein, the insulation will keep the protein apart. Uh, insulation doesn't actually exist in the electrical world to the extent that Maxwell's equations say there's fields all over the place, right? So how does electrical stuff work? It works because wires carry the, you know, concentrate the field and carry it or the, the charge around. Well, you know, we have a wire. Look at this. There's our wire right there. It's that blue thing underneath. It's the DNA. It's a thing which actually is insulated from the other parts around it. So if polymerase crosses on the wire, the DNA, it doesn't in fact flow all over the cell. So another way to think about it is we actually have a spot where there's wires. Now, the truth is that the protein field does go all over the cell, and we have to design the proteins so that they don't do that. Okay. So what we do is we make an inverter. Okay. Now, let me come at this a different way. So let's suppose that we want to make a lot of money. Remember, we quit our jobs, and we went, we went into the garage to make a nice thing, and here's what we made. We made a, ni a whole bottle of nice, bright red luciferase. It's really cool. Would you like to use it? I want to sell it to you. Uh, you activate it by expressing protein XZY32. Customers? By the way, you can't PCR out just the good part. Right? I mean, something pretty useless. So I go back and say, the customers didn't like it. Nobody applauded. Nobody wanted to buy it at the conference. What they said was, we need it in 47 other proteins, sensitive to 47 other proteins. So let's get to work making all the other versions of my wonderful luciferase. If on the other hand, we say, put pops in and it lights up, that's much better. Because we then can go on to work on the next color of our luciferase and you can use the product. In a similar way, we have all these wonderful th systems that have been put together by the different people in the presentations and the posters. And can their devices be used together? If they had been designed so that pops were the interface, then you'd say, what are the levels that you used to see if the levels are compatible? And are the proteins compatible or not? And you'd be done. This way, you have to say, well, what protein levels are used at the interface? And I think many of them won't actually work together. OK, so pops are good. That nail's been hit again. OK, so that's enough about the registry and what's going on there. We, as I said at the beginning of this, of this presentation, there were two ways to work on the, the idea of synthetic biology that Drew expressed before. One of them is go into the lab and figure out how to make each of the things inside work in great detail and come back about three years from now and have the conference and, and present it all. It might even be harder than that. The other way is to imagine the future and proceed, find out where we stumble. So MIT has an independent activities period in January. So for January 2003, we decided that we would hold a course. Uh, we actually had a discussion where we said, is it really fair to the students to hold a course in a field that we don't really understand? Are we really teaching them anything? And then Tom and Jerry pointed out that actually you hold courses so that the professors learn. Okay? It's important you not actually tell the students about that. But we decided we would hold the course and see what happened. And our model was that they would design systems, and we got a generous contribution to support DNA synthesis, direct DNA synthesis. And we told them that this was all work. We told them about the design principles. And then we kind of left them alone, encouraged them. And they went off to develop fabulous systems. Uh, that worked out great. We got parts out of that. I'll go into a little bit more detail there. We held a similar course this last January. 
uh, we were able to build on some of the knowledge we had from the previous course, uh, and it worked great. It created the, the booperator with the chemotaxis stuff, and we haven't yet found out whether that works. We also have, Tom also taught a course here on engineering bio, simple biological systems. Uh, we have the, com the uh, conference this weekend, and we have a summer competition in, uh, happening this summer with five schools. We also began the MIT Register of Registry of Standard Biological Parts, and you can see that that is a very prototypical system. It's a prototype. It's not finished. It's not ready. We're going to learn a lot and then we're going to do it again. In 2003, we had 16 students on four teams, four students per team. Half of the students were biology, half engineering, half undergraduate, half graduate. Four weeks, we did system design for two weeks, and then we made them design the parts and how the system we put together, mostly just based on the repressilator, which Michael did, it was wonderful. Uh, as MIT students, they all thought, oh yeah, that's really cool, we can do better, right? So you gotta have some motivation like that for your students. If you wanna have courses like this, you know, the students drive it. Uh, the problem with the repressilator was, from their point of view, that it wasn't stable. Uh, one of the groups says, well, let's put two in the same cell, then like two clocks on the wall, they'll get into synchrony and the, whichever one is not working will help the other one that is working. They designed the parts as, uh, and the system as parts, like uh, Drew explained before. They figured out what the design of the subcomponents had to be. They did experiments of, or specified experiments that would keep the, uh, the basic oscillators in balance, and Reshma has been uh, continuing some of the balance and crosstalk experiments. And they made a big long list of parts for us to send out and have fabricated. And we thought, great, we won. We got parts out of it. Another group made a, a notice that a flaw with the, the, the pictures Michael made were that the cells didn't stay together. They weren't all on and or all off. You know, some were on, some were off, and not very well behaved. So they put a cell-cell signaling pathway in the oscillator, uh, and they didn't know quite how that would work, so they specified four different versions of it. They made their design. Uh, they made a detailed list of all the parts that they would require uh, and the green is the, the place where variations in the design occur. And their model was that an individual repressilator, according to their simulations, would die out, but these colony synchronized uh, systems would oscillate very nicely, which was probably hard to see down at the bottom, but the, all the curves look like that black one. Okay, they made test parts for that. Now, we were very optimistic. If we weren't optimistic, we would never do this. Uh, we're overly optimistic. We're proud of it. We said, we'll design in January, the parts will be back, and we'll have the systems done by June, and people can try, try out their systems. Turns out that, number one, after we worked so hard in February and didn't answer any other emails, we took, uh, in January, we took February to recover, okay, and rest, and go, ah, what was all that? And we did testing and checking of what the student designs were and kind of fixed that up. We got the parts in and did synthesis. We thought that would take three months. And for many of the parts, probably half the parts, it actually took three months. The other parts, the cells didn't like. And they fought back. And we then figured out that the right way would be a inducible copy number plasmid. We did that, got it all straightened out, got all the parts fixed up. Everybody's happy. Uh, we then, it was by that time, about September, uh, we started to work on how to assemble these things, and that took several months as well. A lot of learning going on. Uh, we learned lots about parts, design, how to do things. We understood about POPs, uh, and we found that problems worthy of attack prove their worth by fighting back, and biology does that. Must be a worthy problem. For the IAP 2004, we went for genetically engineered polka dots. And here's our, our, uh, our poster. All right, thank you. The draw for the course was that people would make new friends? The draw for the, no, the yeah, I know. No, the draw, you, you know, the draw for the course was, you know, you're actually in there designing real genetic stuff, and we're going to build it, right? We increased the number of students. Uh, in the first case, we had 16 students. We had about 30 applicants. Uh, we increased it to 
teams of five, 20 students. Uh, we got 64 applicants. We started to get static from the applicants. Uh, we heard things like, it's easier to get into MIT grad school than it is to get into your course. Uh, uh, we started to hear, uh, Drew was at a dinner one time and uh, one of the other professors says, yeah, my, my, my kid wants to go to MIT so he can take your course. So we go, ah, okay. We realized that the February resting month was not critical to the process. But we couldn't fix that, so we said, what we'll do is we'll design two weeks, parts design two weeks, we'll do system design, we'll make the students check the parts and order them. And actually, by the Thursday at the end of the January month, all the parts went out for synthesis. Uh, Drew's already shown you this, so I, I'm just going to go right past it. So the, the process was actually improved a fair amount. You can see, the part synthesis happened much more quickly. We expected that we would move into assembly right away, but instead we've decided that we needed to do some part, uh, part measurement activity instead, and so we haven't yet begun the, uh, most of the uh, assembly for the 2004 case. Now, with that great success, nothing works, right? Great success in teaching the students, learning about what this should be like, and all of the excitement that we have, we decided it was time to do, to broaden this to a larger community. So this summer, we have five schools, Boston University, Caltech, MIT, Princeton, and University of Texas at Austin. Uh, each has a team of order of a dozen students. Uh, we have parts available from the registry. We have a nice, big, fat synthesis budget. Uh, we got money from NSF. And we're going to provide help in teaching and assembly and all of that. We got some dark information. So the construction schedule is something like this, although this tends to be the model that we had from the course. And obviously you want to you know, do construction and assembly and synthesis through the whole summer. Okay, so to wrap that all up right before the, the, uh, the panel, what we did with the registry of standard parts is we made an online data book and registry for the information about parts. We made a repository of the physical parts so you can actually get a hold of them. Uh, right now, that's limited to the people in the summer competition. We're very interested in opening that up to more people. Uh, we have a service for assembly for the people in the competition. We're going to have to work on measurement and quality control. And one of the things that a registry needs to do is work on the, com the community of standardization. So in the electrical world, there are a lot of groups that work on what standards should be the standard? How should things be measured? Uh, what will be a useful way to measure things? And I think we're going to have to do a similar thing here so that we're able to use the intelligence of the whole community. We're interested in this being, and I, I know that Stallman hasn't come by yet, right? So I can still say open source. But obviously, free biology or open source biology, something in that area is pretty important to us because we would like people to, who are working in their labs and make an interesting thing to be able to send it into the registry and know that it will become available to everybody else. And that's a piece that's really we haven't been doing very much yet. I'm hoping we're able to begin to do that this summer and get some, because there's great parts out there, there's great talent, and the work you do can be transferred to other people in terms of the paper you write and then they have to do all the physical work or it can be transferred in addition by providing parts that other people can use. And I, that has been a, that process has been a key process of feedback in the electrical industry, where things developed in one part of the electrical industry are fed back and help the development of the technology itself. And to the extent that we're going to have exponential growth in what we can do in biology, I think it will come, be, come because everybody's work feeds back into everybody else's work the next time around. And one of the ways that we're looking at that is we have the MIT registry, but I'm imagining a world wide web of registries and information and parts. Okay, questions? Is there a bias towards 
using pieces that have crystal structures available so people can also work at that level? Uh, with